Hi, everyone. How's the audio? Good? Awesome. Before I share a lot of data with you, let's loosen up and get to know each other a little better. Tell me, who prefers coffee over tea? OK? Sorry, tea people. I'm a coffee girl, too. Uh, who prefers watching TV over reading a book? It looks like 50-50. I like to read a book while wa sipping coffee. <laughs> who prefers summer over fall? Summer. I'm team fall with that coffee, reading a book. You know what I mean? Cozy season. OK, here's one more. Would you rather care for the ones that you love or show up for work? Stumped ya. In the past, I'd say, what, three years, you all have been challenged with what probably seems like the impossible. How do you continue to encourage your employees to show up, be productive, don't leave your company, join your company during a pandemic, in a remote world, in a hybrid world, when you face an economic downturn, without many resources, the challenges for you all go on and on and on. And every single year, we survey HR leaders and we ask them about their priorities and the, the trends evolve based on these new challenges that you all are kind of gifted with. It's a gift to be challenged. Today, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about the caregiving crisis. If you've stopped by our table up there in the corner, which a lot of you have had, we have had very passionate conversations about, you, about what you and your employees are facing right now when it comes to child care. We're going to talk about why this is a business problem. Many of you already agree with that. We're going to talk about how companies have reported that they're optimizing and changing their benefit strategies. And then we're also going to talk about what you can do today as an individual and as a representative of your business to help with this problem. But let's start with a lot of scary data. The state of caregiving in the United States right now is quite frankly terrifying. It's expensive and it's unaccessible. 73% of your workforce is a caregiver. Show of hands, how many of you serve as the primary caregiver for a child in your home or for one of your adult loved ones that may be aging in place or outside of the home? Show of hands. I can see that about 73 or more percent of you are raising your hands. And if you weren't raising your hands, maybe you are the caregiver for a pet. 50 million workers in our workforce have a child under the age of 14, and one in six employees who are sitting in this room and in your workforce are responsible for caring for an aging loved one. And 70% of everybody that I've just talked about has had significant productivity impact because of their caregiving responsibilities. If you're a parent, think about when you get that dreaded phone call from school because so-and-so has to leave because they have a stuffy nose or they get sick. Think about that time when maybe you got a call because your mother or your father had a fall and they need your urgent help. Think about a time that you had to take your dog to the vet because they ate something they shouldn't have eaten and now all of a sudden you can't go to work and be in that meeting. We've all faced it. There are major problems with the caregiving crisis that we have in the United States right now and problem number one is the cost. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, this is the average breakdown of American budgets. 50% of the typical salary is attributed to housing, insurance, savings, and health care. 50% off the top, bye. There it goes. Another 17% on average is attributed or dedicated to transportation. 13% is typically used to feed yourself and your family. You have a sad 5% dedicated to entertainment and fun and 12% allocated to other. Now, according to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, child care is affordable if it takes up 7% or less of your income. For those of you that are paying for child care right now, do you think you're spending more than 7%? 
do you think you're spending more than 15%? I'm going to go to venture that you and the majority of your employees are actually paying 27% on average of your household income for childcare. So what gives? I don't know. We see, we've, I've talked to many of you who have said, I've had employees who had to leave the workforce because it just didn't make sense for them to put multiple children in daycare. Or I have employees who can't show up to work because their daycare is closing. Or, 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 the stories go on and on and on. This data is from the 2023 cost of care report that we just released. We release it every single year. It's fresh. The problem doesn't stop with childcare. We also know senior care is expensive. You can see these numbers. They're far too big for me to build into my budget. I'm assuming they're far too big for you to build into your budget and your employee's budget. So after we figure out how to pay for childcare, which on average is twice the cost of in-state tuition, now we need to figure out how to solve for the sandwich generation, which has to figure out how to care for their aging loved ones. Millennials are the largest generation in the workforce. They're also the largest generation that is part of the sandwich generation. So that huge generation that we've been talking about supporting since they've entered in the workforce now has a massive and expensive problem on their hands. Problem number two, caregiving is inaccessible. I haven't had the pleasure of having a child yet but when I read the data, I can tell you, quite frankly, I am very nervous. 51% of our nation lives in what is called a child care desert. A child care desert means that for every five children under the age of five, there is one licensed daycare spot available. And my friends, we are sitting smack dab in one of the biggest child care deserts in our nation. 64% of parents have been waitlisted for daycare. Almost 50% have been waitlisted for more than three months. That is longer than the average time most employers offer their employees for leave. So we celebrate the fact that we provide leave to our employees. It may not be enough, actually, to help them get to the next point of finding childcare, but 25% of those who are on waitlist have actually been on those waitlists for over a year. And then when we talk about senior care, quite honestly, when I was making these slides, I was looking at all of the stats. There are shortages in nursing homes. There are shortages in long-term care facilities. There are shortages for those who have to come into your home to care for your loved ones because that is not a career that anybody really wants, especially after the pandemic. But wait, there's more. In four days, this is going to get a lot worse. Has anybody heard the term child care cliff? On September 30th, this Friday, in four days, funding from the American Rescue Plan will expire. $24 billion in federal funding for child care will no longer be available. There are 70,000 child care centers in our nation today who stay open because of that funding. And those child care centers take care of 3.2 million children. Now, Friday, we will learn just how bad this is going to impact our working nation and, quite frankly, your employees. In New York, though, let's talk about close to home. 251,509 children, to be exact, are at risk for losing their access to over 5,000 child care programs that benefit from this funding. Working parents of those children could lose up to $846 million in earnings because they are going to have to figure out a new caregiving solution and that may be cutting back their hours or leaving the workforce entirely. And that is going to cost us, cost us all as employers about a billion dollars in this state alone. When we look at the total projected loss that employers face due to child and senior care needs, my friends, we are surpassing $30 billion a year. So $30 billion is a lot of dollars, and I think I would argue that caregiving is, in fact, a business problem that we have to work together to solve. Without care, people simply cannot work. 
87% of employees have missed work when their regular care is not available. Many of us in this room have our own story that we can tell related to that. We know 20% of working parents have had to quit or reduce their hours because of their caregiving needs, especially since the pandemic. And 70% of those who care for their parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, any adult loved one in their life have seen a negative impact on productivity at work. This is a business problem. Every year we survey you all, we survey HR leaders, and we ask them what their strategies are for the coming year. What are you doing with your benefits to solve for the business problems that you outline, and how has that changed year over year? Well, this year, almost 100% of you said, hey, look, Jess, things are changing. We're recalibrating our benefits. 95% of you said that over, almost 50% of you said, in fact, we are trimming back our benefits. Okay. When I, we asked, okay, so you're recalibrating your benefits and you're trimming back your benefits, what are you doing to your benefit strategy to support your business goals? What are those business goals? Well, over half of you said that we are designing our benefits program to focus on productivity in our workforce. And over 49% of you said we are designing our benefits program to focus on retaining our top talent and our employees. Now, we've all read the headlines about layoffs, reduction in force, pulling back on resources. This makes perfect sense. You have fewer resources, so you need your employees to be productive with fewer resources, but you need those employees to stay, so you need to retain them to be productive with fewer resources, and we are in a vicious cycle here. We also asked HR leaders, who exactly are you designing your benefits for? And to be quite honest with you, I don't like what I see here on the screen. As you go down this chart here, you start to recognize different employee types that I like to call the engine of the American workforce. The people who, quite frankly, need your help the most. So I share this data because I want us all to think about when we're going into 2024 or even planning for 2025, are we addressing those in our workforce that truly make the engines of our businesses hum and that need our help the most? You tell me. We asked employers, okay, in 2023, going into 2024, what is the priority for you this year? Almost 50% of them said, we are prioritizing childcare more this year than we did last year. 43% said we are prioritizing senior care more this year than we did last year, which is fantastic. Because like I said a few slides ago, we are in the midst of a caregiving travesty in the United States. And it's going to take employers stepping up it's gonna take providers stepping up to improve options, and it's gonna take change in DC to evolve policy to truly solve for this travesty. Investing in family care benefits is good for business, and I remember talking to a few of you today and you said, Jess, childcare is in the news every single day. It is in the news every single day. You are hyper aware of the fact that family care benefits have become a part of the narrative since the pandemic, but your employees are also aware of that fact. Providing child and senior care benefits is quickly becoming the expectation of the workforce, and they understand that if my employer isn't willing to support me and those who I love at home, there are options out there for me to go and find a different employer who is. There is a direct connection between those who offer things like backup care and saved missed productivity in the workforce. For example, Employers who offer something like backup care to their workforce, for every employee that has access and uses backup care, they save 10 missed days of work per employee per year. So if you work in retail, or you work on a manufacturing line, or you work in a hospital, take 10 days per year times the number of parents you have in your workforce that wouldn't miss work, and you can quickly calculate the productivity, productivity savings that you would see. There's a lot of data that I've thrown at you. There's a lot that's going on right now. And in the next four days, regardless of the news outlet that you read, you are going to read about the child care cliff that we are facing come Friday, September 30th. There are things that you can do, though, right now to prepare to offer child and senior care benefits to your workforce or evolve the benefits that you already have in place. This is the time where I'm gonna give you some resources. You can take out your cameras, scan these QR codes, get these resources, or come see me after. 
But let's talk about how you start. The first thing that you do is survey your employees. And when you survey your employees, please, I beg you, do not ask them, what benefits do you want? They are not in HR. They don't know what benefits are out there. They don't know how to design a program that's inclusive and scalable and flexible for your workforce. Ask them about what is distracting them at home, what is causing them stress outside of work that they're carrying on their shoulders when they come to work. There's a template in here that you can use, that you can modify, and there's best practices for launching this survey in your workforce. Here's the best practice for you. In order to drive high adoption of the survey, I encourage you to lean on your managers. Your managers are kind of the front line of your employees. They're the first ones who hear about child and senior care problems. They're the first ones who recognize that an employee is in distress. And when it comes to getting their feedback in what could be one of the most valuable surveys of the year, they can help drive adoption. Tip number two is to follow up. If you're asking your employees for their time to share their precious opinion, you need to commit back to them that you're going to share what you learned and also the near and long-term changes that you will explore to help address some of those learnings. Two tips, there's more in here. So you survey your workforce, step done. Jess, what's the next step? The next step is you need to advocate for care. The majority of the data that I shared with you today is in these two reports. The Care for Business Future of Benefits report, that's where we survey 500 HR leaders every year, and the 2023 Cost of Care report. This shows a decade of the cost of care and how that's risen over time. Both of these can be helpful tools for you as you advocate for caregiving benefits for your workforce. So you say, cool, Jess, I surveyed my workforce, check done. I got the research, check done. I have the buy-in from my CEO or my CHRO, check done, now what? Now you need to evaluate the market. This can be complicated. There are a lot of providers that are popping up in this space, and some of them are very niche and address one specific problem, which may work for you. But there's others that address the full life cycle of caregiving that employees face. When people first come and talk to us at the table, they say, oh, family care, we have leave. I say, OK, that's a good start. But those babies that are born grow up. And then they go to school after they grow up and they go through childcare or have a nanny, and they need after school care. And then during the time when they're in school, they probably need help with tutoring and then college prep. And then once you get your kids out the door, oh my gosh, sandwich generation, millennials, hi, we're caring for our parents and aging loved ones now. So when you're thinking about a program, you need to think about something that truly evaluates the whole life cycle of care. I very much appreciate your time. I, I give you a lot of data, but if I can leave you with something, it is this. As individuals, as business leaders, and as companies, it is our responsibility to take a step forward to help solve this caregiving crisis. I don't know how bad it's going to be on October 1st, but I know it certainly is not going to get any better than it is right now. My name is Jess Marble. I will be right there in that corner if you have any questions. Thank you for your time.